back and forth. Debate begins over what should be included in the next COVID-19 stimulus package. We're on Capitol Hill. Traditional look. New developments in the redesign of historic Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Museum or mosque. A court in Turkey weighs in on the status of Hagia Sophia, a one-time church dating back from the 6th century. And the beauty of faith. We look at a painting depicting the life of St. Benedict, whose feast day is tomorrow. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, July 10th, 2020. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump is hitting the road again. He is in Florida today, but a planned rally for tomorrow in New Hampshire is canceled because of the weather. This comes as the president and his Democratic opponent, Joe Biden, trade insults. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, here at the White House, we're learning tonight that New Hampshire event has been rescheduled or will be rescheduled, I should say, for a later date. Meanwhile, the president left for Florida today with an eye on the skies and his November opponent. So we're going to Miami. Before heading off to Florida, President Donald Trump told reporters he and FEMA are keeping a very close eye on Fay. Tropical Storm Fay is probably going to be hitting a place called New Jersey, a good place, pretty soon. So we uh, we are on the watch. We are fully prepared. FEMA's ready. And when asked about Joe Biden's economic plan? He plagiarized from me, but he can never pull it off. He likes plagiarizing. The president called the former vice president's new proposal a radical left plan. That can't be the same because he's raising taxes way too much. He's raising everybody's taxes. He's also putting tremendous amounts of regulations back on. Just the other day, Biden tore into President Trump. The truth is, throughout this crisis, Donald Trump has been almost singularly focused on the stock market, the Dow and NASDAQ. Not you, not your families. As for the president's continued push to reopen schools this fall, today he tweeted, now that we have witnessed it on a large-scale basis and firsthand, virtual learning has proven to be terrible compared to in-school or on-campus learning. Not even close. Schools must be open in the fall. If not open, why would the federal government give funding? It won't. Meanwhile, in Florida, a state facing an alarming surge in COVID-19, the president visiting U.S. Southern Command to highlight a reduction in the flow of illegal drugs, praising them for their work seizing illegal drugs much. and arresting traffickers. We're determined to keep dangerous drugs out of the country and away from our children. We're securing our seas. We're securing our borders. This is a new operation, not been done before. In Florida, the president also held a roundtable supporting the people of Venezuela who implored the president keep socialism and communism and dictatorship out of the United States, citing their own tragic examples of what happened to their families in places like Cuba. Tracy? White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Thank you so much, Owen. Now, President Donald Trump's former attorney who was released from jail because of the coronavirus pandemic is now back behind bars. Michael Cohen is in federal prison after being accused of violating the terms of his home confinement. Cohen denies the claim. In 2018, he pleaded guilty to tax evasion, campaign finance fraud, and lying to Congress. Last May, he was permitted to serve the remainder of his three-year term at home because of the pandemic. COVID-19 outbreaks continue to cause trouble for the U.S. economy. Fame motorcycle maker Harley-Davidson says it will eliminate 700 corporate jobs. Just one of the many companies making cuts, and the pressure is on for Congress to pass another stimulus bill. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric? Well, Tracy, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi continues her push to have the Senate take up the $3 trillion HEROES Act, but Republicans tell EWTN News that will not happen in its present form. Speaker Nancy Pelosi is pushing for another stimulus package to become law soon. It's an imperative uh, that we put something together that passes out of the Congress, signed by the president by the end, end of July. And she's not afraid of a big price tag. I'm saying trillion. Trillion for state and local. Trillion for 
uh, unemployment insurance and uh, direct payments. Trillion with a TR. House Democrats want to extend the extra $600 a week in added unemployment benefits through January. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy says even some Democrats are noticing those extra unemployment payments are hurting small businesses. People are actually getting more money to stay off work than be able to come back. And we know it's important that people have jobs in America, and that's what our focus. That's why in committee we should look at this and see what is the best benefit to keep America safe, secure, but actually rebuild the economy. Research fellow Joel Griffith agrees with Leader McCarthy. It would be a good economic idea to adjust that, to make sure that no one is earning more off the job than on the job. And he tells me we can't expect COVID aid to last forever. We need aid to be temporary and we need it to be directed. Unfortunately, a lot of what we've seen has not, not been uh, very directed towards those uh, businesses and people that are actually suffering most of this. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has vowed the next aid bill will, quote, include legal protections to help schools and businesses reopen. This is liability protection for everyone. Hospitals, doctors, nurses, businesses colleges, universities, K through 12 educators, everybody who interacted with this pandemic. And Catholic Congressman Brad Winstrup told EWTN News Nightly, local governments need the tools to help those suffering. We need to empower local authorities to do more for others. And I also believe that it's a community response. And in some places, we've gotten away from that. Liability protection seems to be a major sticking point between the two parties. Now, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin did t say that he is willing to have another round of possible stimulus checks. He says when senators get back from their July 4th recess, he hopes to have a deal ironed out at the end of this month. Tracy. OK, thank you, Eric. Correspondent Eric Rosales reporting from Capitol Hill. Several areas around the world are reporting setbacks in the fight against the coronavirus. In Hong Kong, officials say there has been a rise in the number of reported cases. It is possible that more cases will come and there's a, um, uh, there's a possibility of a big um, community outbreak. Officials reported nearly three dozen new cases today, bringing the total to more than 1,400. The former British territory, territory had enjoyed months of success against the pandemic, and now the government and its leaders are tightening social distancing measures as well as closing schools. In India, health workers are going door-to-door -door looking for people with symptoms. Workers in Mumbai are checking residents for high temperatures or any complaints of a cough or a cold. This week, more than 26,000 cases were reported in India in just one day, prompting some states to go back to stringent lockdowns. And in Israel, the country's prime minister is addressing an economic crisis and rising unemployment brought on by the coronavirus crisis. <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu says it is difficult to balance keeping people healthy while saving the economy. In a nationally televised address last night, he said the government will provide funding for the unemployed and for struggling business owners. <laughs> In Jordan, people took to the streets to protest Israel's plans to annex parts of the occupied West Bank. The demonstrators also denounced the Middle East peace plan proposed by the United States. A longtime cathedral in Turkey dating from the 6th century has been turned back into a mosque. Istanbul's iconic Hagia Sophia, a longtime cathedral, had been a museum since the 1930s. Turkey's president restored its previous status as a mosque following a court ruling earlier today. The proposal drew widespread criticism from the United States and Orthodox Christian leaders. It is also strongly opposed by neighboring Greece. Officials in France say Notre Dame Cathedral will be rebuilt just as it was before last year's devastating fire. President Emmanuel Macron had initially pushed for contemporary touches to the 12th century church, including a swimming pool or organic garden on the roof. This week, however, he approved designs to make it identical to the version destroyed in the fire. Officials are aiming for the church to be reopened by 2024. 
The Vatican Museums reopened a little over a month ago. However, tourism numbers are not like they were before. The museums normally host over 6 million visitors a year, but with many international borders still closed, the galleries are sparse. But for tour guides, it hasn't been easy. Sister Emanuela Edwards from the Missionaries of Divine Revelation joins us now from Rome. Sister, welcome. I know your community provides art and faith tours at the Vatican Museums. Can you talk about what it's been like to be back after being closed for about three months? Yes, I mean, I have to say, I went to the museum for the first time on, on Saturday, and it, it was like a real breath of fresh air, you know, from the start when I entered the museum again after such a, such a long time. And the museum have made all these arrangements uh, so that you enter and they control your temperature as you go in. But then, of course, shortly after you've entered, you forget everything as you uh, take in the, the beauty of, uh, of the surroundings and the wonderful art. And I think as well, you know, there's that personal touch as well as you start to see all the people who you're so used to working with over the years. And so there was kind of, uh, there was a kind of a, f a freshness about it, almost the, uh, the, the, the pull of the Holy Spirit that, that calls us on to continue this, this wonderful mission. And everybody kind of feels a joy to see people who they've, they've worked with when finally you come back into the museum. So it was, it, it was a great joy to, to return. That's so wonderful to hear. Uh, I know the pandemic has affected life in so many ways for all of us. How has it affected your apostolate work? Well, I mean, uh, what, what can I say? As soon as the lockdown started in Italy, uh, we weren't able to work anymore in the museum. And, and indeed, as with the rest of Italy, we, we were locked down in the convent. And so we, we, uh, we did two things, really. The first thing we did was we intensified our prayer. We had the, the, the great grace of having a priest who was, uh, who was with us at the convent. And so we were able to, uh, to have the Holy Mass and Eucharistic adoration. And so we intensified our prayer for all those who were asking our help and to pray for the world at this time. And so we, we lived our contemplative life to the full, what one may say. On the other hand, we also had to find a way to go out and, and help the many people who were asking us questions. And so we started to web stream conferences and also the Holy Rosary uh, and the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. And so that gave us a way of continuing to meet those who, who were looking to the missionaries for a word of encouragement and the catechesis of art using faith. And so we, we found a way to do it uh, despite all the, all the difficulties. Sister, before I let you go, I'm curious, what was convent like during the peak of the pandemic in Italy and how are you doing right now? The, what can I say? The, the convent for us, um, it, you know, we weren't able to go out. We, we, were, we, 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 we had Eucharistic adoration. We adored the Lord and we prayed for all those intentions that, would, that we were receiving. Uh, obviously, there was the, there was a thought for all those who were suffering outside as well. Some of the reports uh, coming down from from North Italy were very worrying, and lots of people called us and asked us to pray. And so, uh, and so, we continued to do what we told everyone else to do to pray. Um, now, as as things are, are more relaxed and we can start to 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 go out once again, um, what can I say? Life is returning to a normal program. Um, although we're not yet doing uh, our regular series of tours. And so we're continuing to, to, to pray for the, for the resolution of this pandemic. And also, I think the, the experience of that time has also developed our apostolate because now we've got this wonderful facility to go online uh, and do web streams and Zooms with our conferences to make us uh, more available to, to those who can arrive uh, in Rome or the museum. Well, Sister, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, and thank you for what you do. Sister Emanuela Edwards from the Missionaries of Divine Revelation. Thank you again, Sister. Thank you. God bless. Coming up, analysis of a busy week at the Supreme Court. As the Supreme Court begins its summer recess, we take a look back at this term and a few of the High Court's biggest decisions involving religious liberty and pro-life issues. Joining me now on Skype to help us do just that is Amy Howe, co-founder of SCOTUS Blog. Amy, welcome back. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. 
Well, Amy, we have a lot to talk about, but I want to focus on a couple of cases of special interest to our audience. Uh, yesterday, we spoke with Sister Constance Veet with the Little Sisters of the Poor about the High Court's decision in their case. What are your thoughts on that ruling and its significance when it comes to religious freedom? So it's an interesting case because it is, you know, technically not a religious freedom case. The Supreme Court in that case was considering, the, it ruled that these exemptions from the Affordable Care Act's birth control mandate that the Trump administration created didn't violate the Affordable Care Act and that when the Trump administration issued these rules back in 2017 and 2018, that it checked all the boxes and crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's as a procedural matter. But obviously, it you know, it, it is allowing these exemptions to go into place. So it's got incredible significance for the employers who will now be able to claim them. And the other thing that the Supreme Court said was that the language of the Affordable Care Act gives the federal government a lot of discretion to decide who gets these exemptions. So even though it's, it's not a religious freedom case in the sense that they're not interpreting the Constitution or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, it's still obviously very important to the employers who want to claim this exemption. Yeah, we also saw an important ruling on behalf of religious schools and their ability to hire and fire teachers. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Sure. That was a case brought by two elementary school teachers in Southern California. They taught at Catholic schools. They were both fired. One alleged that it was because of age discrimination. The other one alleged that it was because she had announced that she had breast cancer. And the Supreme Court said that Catholic schools, uh, you know, schools in general are going to have a, a lot of discretion to say what counts as a minister uh, and which employees therefore cannot bring employment discrimination suits. A uh, decision by Justice Samuel Alito, the Supreme Court said that really what matters is what an employee does. And so even if a, a faith doesn't call someone a minister, you know, doesn't, the person doesn't necessarily have religious training, hasn't gone to seminary, if this person is regarded as have, serving in an important religious role, sort of praying, teaching, then they may not be able to sue their employer for employment discrimination. Yeah, unfortunately, that wasn't all good news. There was some dis uh, disappointing decisions for pro-lifers when the court overturned a Louisiana law holding abortion clinics to the same standards as other surgical centers. Can we talk about that and the role that Chief Justice John Roberts played in that decision and throughout the term? Sure. Justice, uh, the, the Chief Justice John Roberts uh, provided the fifth vote, joining the court's former liberal justices to strike down a Louisiana law um, the interesting thing was that he didn't join the four justices. He he wrote his own opinion, and he said, in essence, that a, a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court had struck down a very similar law out of Texas, and so he was going to uh, also vote to strike down the Louisiana law. But he made the point that it was that that it was really this decision was because the Louisiana law was so similar to the Texas law. So he didn't necessarily say how he would vote if there were other abortion laws that weren't similar to the Louisiana law. And he also made the point that he believed that the test for when an abortion law is unconstitutional is more lenient than what Justice Breyer had described in his opinion for the former liberal justices. And so a couple of days later, the Supreme Court actually sent uh, a couple of cases back to the lower courts, uh, challenges to laws out of Indiana involving uh, ultrasounds, for example. And these were laws in which the, the cases in which the laws had been struck down by the lower courts, but instead of upholding the laws, the Supreme Court actually sent them back for another look, presumably because they thought that the lower courts had, prov had applied the wrong test. Well, Amy, thank you so much for coming on today. We always appreciate your analysis. Amy Howe, co-founder of SCOTUS Blog. Thanks again, Amy. Thank, thanks for having me. Well, the Archdiocese of New York says that it will close 20 Catholic schools. Three others will be forced to merge. The moves are due to financial shortcomings brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Officials say they are helping the affected families by nearby Catholic schools for the fall. For more on the story, including the reaction of Cardinal Timothy Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, visit our partners at CatholicNewsAgency.com.
Up next, we examine the life and lessons of St. Benedict. Tomorrow we celebrate the Feast of St. Benedict, the 6th century abbot who gave Christian monasticism its lasting foundation in Western Europe. Joining me now on Skype to help us take a look at St. Benedict through art is Jim Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Jim, welcome back. So good to see you. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Jim, tell us about St. Benedict, whose feast day that we celebrate tomorrow. St. Benedict lived in a time of cultural crisis in the years 480 to 547 AD. And since then, the church honors him as an outstanding model of holiness, a worker of miracles, and the founder, the father of Western monasticism. One early turning point in his life came when the young Benedict flees the corruption and moral decay of Rome to live in prayerful solitude in a cave in Subiaco for three years. And soon his holiness and devotion to prayer began to attract many followers. He wrote a guide for monks and nuns, known famously as the Rule of St. Benedict. And this rule helped to spread monasticism and sowed the seeds for a flowering of Christian faith in the Middle Ages. Most of what we know about St. Benedict comes to us from the writings of St. Pope Gregory the Great. In the second book of his dialogues, Pope Gregory highlights key moments in the life of St. Benedict. And this painting shows us one of many miracles credited to St. Benedict. Jim, it looks like the painting is divided in half with two scenes. What is the artist depicting here? You know, it appears that the painting is divided in two, but in fact, it's one single scene. Uh, if we begin on the left side, we see the haloed figure of St. Benedict sitting in an interior space. And as Pope Gregory's story goes, a young boy named Placidus, who lived in the monastery, uh, was sent to fetch water from a nearby stream. The currents were too strong, and the young boy begins to drown. St. Benedict senses the child is in danger. And so, as we see on the left, he sends another monk, St. Morris, to rescue the drowning boy. And this is the rescue that we see on the right side of the painting. Later on, when the boy recounted his experience, he said he felt the abbot Benedict cloak over him at the very moment he was being rescued from the stream. Jim, tell us why St. Benedict is still relevant today and what lessons are there for us in our everyday lives? So prayer and work, ora et labora, is the heart of the rule of St. Benedict. And monks and nuns who followed St. Benedict evangelized and transformed medieval culture through prayer, manual labor, learning, and a life of virtue. They rescued their collapsing culture with the faith in Jesus Christ that they brought to uh, to their culture, just as the child in this story was being rescued from the raging waters. So as the church celebrates his feast day, we seek St. Benedict's intercession for his fidelity to Christ in prayer and for the courage to renew culture in our own day through a new evangelization. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it and sharing this beautiful painting with us. Jim Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you again, Jim. Thank you, Tracy. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.